Okay, so what are the biggest changes? Biggest changes that, that I see as I can review the material, biggest one, well, who knows what's bigger, but multi-axial system is abandoned. And that's a, a big change. For the last uh, 20 years with the DSM-IV, and much longer, if you include the earlier DSMs, we've been using a multi-axial system, you know, axis one, two, you know, three, et cetera. Uh, and that is no longer there. The other major change is spectrum. We'll talk you know, a fair amount about that today, uh, but psychi psychiatric illness as a spectrum uh, is, is a shift that DSM-5 is, is moving into. So goodbye, axis one, two, and three. For the last 33 years since DSM-3, so that's a long time, um, I bet you very few clinicians, if you're a clinician that has been practicing more than 33 years, just type that in uh, the chat box. Uh, one, I'll be impressed, and two, I'll wonder if you remember you know, DSM-2. But for the last 33 years, we have uh, DSM-3 in the, in the five axes. By the way, CPT is current procedural terminology. Okay, so that was pretty close. Uh, and so the, the axes were one, two, three, four, five. And most all of you know this pretty well. If you knew uh, DSM-4 and have been working with it, you're very used to axis one, primary psychiatric disorders, axis two, personality disorders, axis three, medical disorders. And basically, all the first three will just be listed under diagnosis. So if you're evaluating a patient and you're writing the diagnostic, uh, the diagnoses down, you'll just list them all. And you might say major depression, uh, diabetes, high blood pressure, and probable narcissistic personality disorder. And that'll be a list, but no longer segregated into one, two, three. Psychosocial stressors won't be delineated any longer on axis four. And axis five, global assessment of functioning, is also no longer there. Not sure how that will work with uh, managed care. A lot of them want GAF. They get upset if you don't put it in, and they won't pay you if you're not tracking it. Uh, so we'll have to see how they respond to DSM-5. Some questions. We've got uh, 20 ICD-10. We've done that. Uh, Lisa says, there's also a concern about treating adolescents. There seems to be a risk of over pathologizing normal behavior. There are significant implications of diagnosing young people when there really just might be a developmental short-term issue that resolves. Uh, okay. Uh, and, um, yes, absolutely. That is a, a huge controversy and, and issue. I think you indeed see it much more in adolescents because any of us that have teenagers uh, or that don't have teenagers realize that uh, adolescent behavior can be you know, very amplified and it may be completely normal phase and it may not be pathologized at all. Um, so yes, moving to the spectrum uh, has a risk of that. You could also say it is also allowing you to normalize you know, some behavior in the spectrum. Uh, but yeah, for adolescents, I think that's even, even more so. I, I just wanted to make a few comments, um, partly born of the chat room and mm -hmm. some just to frame the conversation. You know, I look at DSM all the way through its various iterations and evolution as being in part originally, I think, a somewhat um, unsuccessful attempt to establish for researchers some consistent criteria by which, as we kind of um, did investigation, there could be some coherence. I think the, the, the unfortunate thing is that quickly became a tool for securing reimbursement. And so my comment, and perhaps in some ways an answer to some of the questions that have been posed in the chat, um, is that a regrettable consequence has been that it, I think it made it very easy, and I'm not sure DSM-5 will resolve this, to see the map as being the same as the territory, that you know the function of having some tools so that there's some coherence for research, useful, but then again, um, we shouldn't reduce people to these categories. And I think one of the comments mm -hmm. that Paul made is relevant is, although this is good for pedagogical purposes to kind of have a spectrum, it kind of um, encourages us, which I think, especially those of us um, interested in depth psychology and Jungian um, um, treatment should be more attuned to not letting this 
be so reductionistic. And I saw Paul's comment about where would where would you put Jung um, of the Red Book on the mm -hmm. spectrum? I don't know. Sometimes I suppose it'd be appropriate to put him in the realm of madness, um, brilliance, mm -hmm. everything in between. And so, you know, one of the things I think we should just be mindful of is the purpose of DSM-5 might regrettably be um, to allow us to have a, a means of billing. Um, mm -hmm. To some extent, it's a research tool, um, which I noticed the question about the NIMH rejecting mm -hmm. DSM-5 might be precisely because it's getting fuzzier. Uh, psychiatric illness as spectrum. So a, a, another interesting change, and, and I think a little bit more interesting, is that DSM-5 is trying to get away from black and white thinking. Uh, so black and white thinking is you have bipolar disorder or you don't have bipolar disorder. A spectrum would be more along the lines of how much bipolarity do you have? All of us have some level of bipolarity do you have a, a little bit? Do you have a lot? What, to what degree is, is bipolarity out there? Um, and we'll see that in different, in different diagnoses. Not 100%. You don't have a 100% you know, spectrum you know, with it. And uh, yeah, we'll look at today. We'll spend you know, some handful of, of snapshots, really images and cartoons, kind of looking at that uh, to some degree. And this is actually controversial. And it's... Uh, Controversial in, in the sense of previously it was, again, real clear, you had the diagnosis or you didn't. With this spectrum approach, you can have mild, you can have moderate, you can have severe, or you can have a whole host of, of other you know, symptoms. And the, uh, the actual terminology of the code sometimes you know, vary. That was somewhat pre prevalent in DSM-4, but you'll see it's more the case in DSM-5. Um, the controversy is this could lead to an overdiagnosis of patients going through normal life stress. So we diagnose them with a mild uh, bipolar or depression, but maybe that's just normal life stress. And we'll talk about more of that in a moment. So the, the question that is somewhat controversial is does it pathologize normal behavior or does it normalize pathologic behavior? So what I'm referring to with that is say you have normal behavior and now we have a diagnostic code that says that's a mild expression of psychiatric illness X, then are we pathologizing something that's a normal behavior? The other way to look at it is you're normalizing pathologic symptoms. So we're saying we all have some level of bipolarity. It's just that most people have a very minimal you know, form of it. Um, so this could go either way. So there's also a new section called post-traumatic, uh, I'm sorry, called uh, trauma-related disorders. And the trauma-related disorders used to be under anxiety, so PTSD was an anxiety disorder, uh, but now it's its own section called the trauma-related disorders. You also have acute stress disorder, which you've always had. That's sort of a, a briefer PTSD, one that hasn't gone six months, I think, the exact criterion, but is more acute. Uh, adjustment disorders, somebody mentioned, I think it was Evanston, about adjustment disorders, and uh, adjustment disorders are no longer mood disorders, so forever, uh, I've been conceptualizing adjustment disorder as, as often a mood disorder, sort of a, more of a mild uh, sort, but uh, now they're saying if you're having an adjustment, it's to something traumatic. It might just be stress at work or a divorce, uh, but there's a, a probably milder trauma than you're adjusting to it. Then a reactive, oops, sorry, a reactive attachment disorder, clean that up, is a, formerly it was in the childhood you know, section, and now they moved it to the uh, the trauma-related uh, section. 